And her research focused on integrated human uh, <laughs> earth system modeling, including work on both uh, the global change yeah. assessment model, exactly. CCM, yeah. and right. integrated I mean, assessment no. model, and the uh, energy. Uh, Sometimes it depends, model. like workshops and, and stuff uh, late at night, I mean, they have, and just to anybody that's already soft. Linkages between energy water, it, man, yeah, I mean, if, if human, this is going to be interesting. system so. feedbacks and scenario development. Or we leave it in the normal um, mode regularly, um, and if a WebEx and needs to happen, we can do Mathematics and computer science from right. University of Maryland. Um, and yeah. MS and PhD degrees in management science and engineering from Stanford University. Let's welcome the speaker. Thank you. Thank you, John. And I'm going to um, try to get us back on time at some point, but please stop me if you have questions as we go. Uh, so as John mentioned, I'm, I do research on integrated human earth system model, and I work at the Joint Global Change Research Institute, um, which you may not know is downstairs. Um, so this is a pretty quick trip for me, despite the fact that I officially work for the Pacific Northwest National Lab. Uh, and so what I want to talk about today, I'm going to go through some background and motivation on why I do this sort of research, um, a brief introduction to the model I'm going to use, and then three highlights um, from three different studies. One, looking at how human systems affect climate. The second, looking at how climate changes affect human systems. And the third, looking at what happens if you examine these two things at the same time. And so just some uh, motivation here, and you guys all may know some of this. Um, uh, so changes in human activities have implications for the Earth system. So as emissions go up, particularly emissions of things like carbon dioxide, temperatures go up. There's also changes in land use and land cover affect climate. Um, and so this is a study here shown on the right where they have the exact same emissions and concentrations in an Earth system model, but two different estimates of land use and land cover change, one with afforestation, one with deforestation. Um, and they're fairly extreme scenarios to sort of uh, explore differences, and what you end up with is in the afforestation world, you end up with warmer temperatures than the deforestation. And this has to do with albedo effects. So if you plant a lot of dark trees in the high latitudes, you change the reflectivity of the Earth's surface and you, and you lead to warming. There are also some studies that I won't go into that look at the effects of irrigation on climate. Um, and so changes in what we do as, as humans affect the Earth system, but at the same time, changes in the Earth system affect human activity. And so changes in climate affect crop yields and land productivity, and that may lead to differences in land use and land cover. Uh, there's changes in energy demand due to rising temperatures. And this is a study on the right looking at building energy demand in the US when you count, account for the fact that temperatures are going up. Um, and what it's showing you is the change in energy demand on net. Um, blue colors are reducing energy demand, red colors are increasing, and what you have is two counterbalancing effects. You, as temperatures go up, you use more air conditioning, less heating. And so the, the lower latitudes end up being on net increases in energy because they're not using that much heating to begin with, and so as temperatures get warmer, they use more air conditioning. When you look at a different place like Maine, you sort of have, you have a reduction in heating due to climate change, but it still doesn't get quite warm enough for that to be offset by the increase in air conditioning. So you have these, these sorts of effects. There are also implications for energy supply, so changes in water availability affect power production. Um, changes in water availability also affect other things like agricultural and land use. Um, climate can affect economic activity, including labor productivity, human health. And so as the climate changes, humans change. And so what I want to do is introduce what the model that I work on, the one we develop here, um, called the, the GCAM model, the Global Change Assessment Model. And what this model is, is it's a global, what's called an integrated assessment model. So it's integrating different systems together. And GCAM in particular focuses on in linking energy, water, land, climate, and the economy together. And each of those systems we represent at different scales. And so that's what the maps on the left are showing. So for energy and the economy, we break the world into 32 regions that are based on geopolitical boundaries. Um, for water, we bake, break the world into 235 water basins, and then the land system is in 384 land regions, and they're the combination of geopolitical and water basins. Then in the, in the, the version of the model we release, we have a, simp a simple uh, reduced form climate model that's just a global model. Um, I'll show you a study later on where we swap that out for a full Earth system model. And so what the model does is it's a representation of technologies and, and economic activity, and it projects that into the future. And you can look at how emissions, land use, land cover, energy, and other things evolve. 
It runs through 2100 in five-year time steps. It's open source, and there's documentation online. And so how it works is what you can think of is it's producing conditional forecasts. So conditional on a set of inputs, it does some calculations, and you get a set of outputs. And the sorts of inputs that we put into the model are things like estimations of population, labor productivity, technology characteristics, resource bases, um, and policy. And policy I'll come back to. Um, and so then there's a set of equations and, and parameters. And then what you get out on the other end is you get, in addition to those things you've put in, you also get emissions, prices, energy supply and demand, agricultural supply and demand, land use, comp concentrations, and temperature. And what's happening in the middle, it's an economic model. And so it's doing economic equations. And in particular, it's a market equilibrium model. So we're going to adjust prices until supplies and demands of all goods and services are equal in each time step. Um, and so we're balancing on the economy. And so you can do a lot of things with this, looking at how um, these different systems will evolve into the future under different conditions. And so the first study I want to look at is how human, changes in human system affect climate. And just as some motivation for this, I'm sure some of you have read the IPCC's fifth assessment report, and they put out a range in temperature change in 2100 from 0.3 to 4.8 degrees Celsius, which is a pretty big range. Um, and there was some more information in there, and so you can look at, they have a figure like this in their report looking at four different scenarios, and when you break down those four scenarios, you narrow the temperature within that. But those temperature bands within those four scenarios, called RCPs here, um, and I can explain more of what those are if people are interested, those are physical uncertainties. So that's the range across a whole bunch of different climate models for one emissions pathway. But there's also a lot of socioeconomic uncertainty. And so how population and income and technology evolve also influence what emissions path we're on and what our resulting temperature rise is. And so the first study I want to show you is exploring that uncertainty. Um, and what it is, um, it's called the shared socioeconomic pathways. And then part of the reason I want to introduce this here is this is what the, the, most of the climate research going forward um, is using. So the uh, IPCC sixth assessment report is going to be structured around these shared socioeconomic pathways. And so what, these, what I'm going to do here is show changes in GCAM and feed those changes in emissions into a simple climate model and look at the resulting effects on temperature. And so the, um, this, these shared socioeconomic pathways were designed by the climate research community starting about uh, five or ten years ago. And they're, they're spanning a range of challenges to mitigation and challenges to adaptation. And so what, uh, they've defined five different scenarios in that space. They all have names. So SSP1 is low challenges to mitigation, low challenges to adaptation. It's called a sustainability world. Where on the other extreme, this SSP3 um, is high challenges to mitigation and high challenges to adaptation. So you might wonder, what does that mean? We can just say it's hard to mitigate, but what does it actually mean to do that? And so what the process was is there was a set of narratives defined um, that we're trying to quantify or to, to qualitatively express what make, makes something easy to mitigate or easy to adapt. And then those were turned into quantifications of GDP, population, and urbanization. And then they were turned into IAM scenario outputs. And that's what I'm going to focus on in the end is what we did to quantify these. But just to start to explain what these are, I'm going to show you some of the elements of the narrative. Um, and so these are some of the storylines in there. And there's basically there's a couple of paragraphs describing each. And it says things like progress towards sustainable development or stabilizing population on the SSP1 side. On the other side, on SSP3, and I'm going to probably contrast those quite a bit, you get rapid population growth and slow economic development. And so these stories you can turn into quantification. And so there was a group um, at IASA in Austria that did population quantifications, and then the OECD turned these into income um, estimates. And so this is showing global population and global GDP across these five scenarios. And what you see is very, very different worlds. So this rapid population growth, SSP3 world, you get increases in population throughout the next century. Uh, on the other hand, SSP1, which is the sustainability world, you get a peak and decline profile in population. If you look at the other side, looking at income, they're very different across those different incomes, depending on other things in the story. These narratives don't just say things about population and income, though. They also tell you things about the technologies and policies um, and resource availability that you might have in those worlds. And so there's things like in the SSP1, it says 
low resource intensity and fossil fuel dependency. Um, in the SSP5, it has high fossil fuel dependency, highly engineered infrastructure and ecosystems. And so those are telling you things about what that world may do. And so when we went about in the GCAM model quantifying these, we took these storylines and translated them into parameters in our model. And so as an example, this is the electric power plant capital cost at the end of the century across technology and SSP. And you might see some things like the, um, some of these worlds have very, very low costs compared to others of some technologies and vice versa. So this SSP4 world is an energy um, focused world and they have very low costs of all energy technologies. Where SSP1, a lot of the investment was focused on renewables. And so it has lower renewable costs, but higher in some of the others. And so these storylines were translated into quantitative parameters, and then we can run these through our model and get different outcomes. And so when you do that, one of the things the model estimates is how much electricity do we need in the future. Um, and so this is showing global electricity generation across these five scenarios. And what's playing out here is a combination of population, so more people, you use more energy. Income, more higher income worlds tend to use more um, energy, as well as these other um, underlying assumptions about resources, because electricity is not our only way of producing it. And so when we get here, in this SSP5 world, we have a whole lot of electricity compared to the SSP3 where we have much less. And this has to do with in the SSP3, um, poorer people are using less energy and they tend to rely more on traditional fuels than on electricity, which takes a lot of infrastructure. Uh, it's not just the total amount though that matters, it's also how it's being produced. And so this is the electricity generation mix by fuel at the end of the century globally. Um, and I'll just point out a couple of parts to this. So the yellow is solar, and so you can see here our sustainability world where they had cheap renewables, you end up using more solar than the other scenarios. Where in the other one, um, other extreme, this uh, SSP5 on the end, there was a lot of investment in fossil fuels, and I didn't focus on that in the parameters, but you end up with cheap, cheaper fossil fuels and you use more of it. So they have more energy, and it's mostly fossil fuel dominated in this particular um, scenario. These storylines also affect land use, and that's something else that's being quantified within GCAM. And so here, population tends to be a, a stronger factor. And so the worlds with higher population use more cropland, because you have to feed more people, you need more land area. And it also has implications for other land covers. So this is showing global land cover at the end of the century. The red is forest, the yellow is cropland. So the higher your cropland is, the less forest you have. So all of this will end up affecting emissions. And so if you've got a world where you're using a whole lot of energy and it's all fossil fuels, you're gonna have a lot more CO2 emissions than other worlds. Um, and we can see that here. So on the left, I'm showing you the global CO2 emissions and they're much, much higher in the SSP5 than they are in these other scenarios. And so the way that this world has unfolded, its population, its income, its technology, its behavior, has resulted in a whole lot more emissions than the other extreme on the SSP1. Um, there's also, a, we don't just quantify CO2, we also look at non-CO2s, and those sometimes have different dynamics. So something like sulfur, sulfur is a local air pollutant and people want to reduce it for human health. And so what you see there is you tend to have lower sulfur emissions in wealthier worlds. So the, the higher the income, the less sulfur we have, because people will control that for human health, not just for climate. And so that's what we're seeing here, is that they're ranked more by their income. And so these result in, um, in, high, uh, in a range in temperature rise from three degrees to four and a half across these. Now, if you remember back to the beginning, I showed you a bigger range. It was 0.3 to 4.8. Well, some of those worlds in that initial IPCC study included mitigation. These first five that I've shown you here haven't. This is just, here's five different worlds. We're not going to try to reduce climate. But what you can do is you can actually pair each of these worlds with a climate mitigation policy and you'll get to, and get to different things. And so that's what I'm gonna do next. And so here I can take each of them and pair them with those RCPs I showed you in the beginning. Um, and RCPs are different levels of climate mitigation. There are some combinations that won't work. So some of these SSPs don't get high enough to get to the highest one that we had in the beginning. And some of them, it's too hard to control emissions and so you can't get down to the lowest. Um, but so when we do this, in order, if you pair one of these worlds with, with mitigation, what we end up doing in the model is we introduce a carbon price. And we adjust that carbon price until we get to the targeted climate level that we want. 
Um, and what that carbon price does is it changes the costs of all of the things. So I said earlier that this is an economic model, and so it's looking at profit maximization or cost minimization depending on the sector. Um, and so if we change the cost of the different technologies, you'll move off of them. And so when you impose a carbon price, you make your fossil fuels more expensive relative to other things. And so as a result, this is looking at changes in electricity generation um, between the reference and, the, and, and the, this lowest, this two degree scenario. Um, and what you see here is that on the bottom, the reductions are all the fossil fuels. So we're moving away from freely vented fossil fuels because of this carbon price. And instead, we get more renewables, nuclear, and precisely which combination and how much depends on the world that we're in. The same thing happens on the land system. Here, you're, you, what you do with land under a carbon price depends a little bit on how you've structured the, the, the incentive. And so in three of these worlds, we end up increasing forest cover because it's a way of reducing carbon emissions. In the fourth world where you see a big cropland expansion, that's where we've in introduced bioenergy. And so we're using the land for bioenergy instead of forests there. And so you get these different incentives. Um, and in the end, what you end up with is very, very different emissions. And so we've reduced our emissions in order to be consistent with this low, um, this low warming level. And you see that play out. And here you get less uncertainty here because the physical system is setting a constraint on total, um, total emissions with some uncertainty having to do with other factors. And so what we can do now in this world is we can span that whole range of temperature we looked at before and now explicitly look at what are the different pathways to get there and what does that mean. Um, and we don't in, in this community, we haven't assigned probabilities to these different things, but you could think about some of these worlds may be easier or harder to get to, some may be more or less likely. There are some factors in there that are um, just uncertainty, so how many people there will be in 2100 is to some extent just an uncertainty, where others have to do with where we invest our um, our R&D our, our funding. So that was the first study. And then what I want to do next is look at it the other way. And so everything I showed you there was focused on how changes in energy, water, and land might affect the Earth system. But at the same time that those um, changes are happening, those Earth system changes are also going to affect the human system. And I'm going to focus on um, the effects of changes in uh, climate on crop yields as my example. And so how does changes in the environment affect yield? Well, temperature, there's some studies looking at um, empirical estimates, and there's field experiments and other things that give us information about how changes in temperature might affect crop yields and other land productivity. So this is from a paper by Wolfram Schlenker and Robert um, in 2009, and it's showing you temperature along the x-axis and crop, log of crop yield along the y. And so higher values mean higher yields, lower values mean lower. And what you can see here is for most crops, there's a range where it's too cold. So by increasing temperature, you get higher. And there's a point in which, it's got quiet. Um, there's a point in which, I think the battery. OK. Well, I'm going to talk in the WebEx people will not hear us for a second. Um, so there's a point in which when it gets too hot and yields start to go down again. And so that's what you're seeing here in corn. It's happening around 30 degrees Celsius that you start to get these declines in yield. Um, when you actually look at this spatially and for different levels of warming, then the exact effects vary depending on where you are and the degree of temperature rise. And so in some, you're starting at a different point in each place. Um, and so where you end up is going to be different. Temperature isn't the only thing that affects crop yields. Precipitation also affects it, as does CO2 concentration, pests and disease, and ozone. All of these things affect your yield in the future, and all of those are evolving as our human systems change over time. Um, and the direction varies. So again, for both temperature and precipitation, it could be a positive or negative effect, depending on the sign and magnitude of the change and where you're starting from. CO2 concentrations are, in general, a good thing in terms of uh, quantity of crops produced. There are some recent studies that show that the nutritional quality of the crops you produce is um, reduced when you have increasing CO2 concentrations. Pests and diseases tend to be bad, um, as does ozone concentration. Um, what I'm going to do in this study, though, is I, I will hold this. OK, so this is a study from a few years ago, and we started what we're going to do is we're going to take the crop yields in GCAM and modify them to reflect climate change. So we're using the same model. I'm just going to change something. 
And what I am starting from, this is actually from the IPCC's fourth assessment of report, and they did a meta-analysis of all the crop yield studies that they could find. And so this, on the x-axis is showing you the local mean temperature change, um, and the y-axis is showing you the percentage change in yield, and this is for two different crops, two different latitudinal bands. Um, I'm just gonna start from this. And the first thing you should note is that these studies are kind of all over the place. And so they've tried to classify them by whether or not they're including adaptation, and that's what's giving you the different colors. But you've got a lot of noise here. And again, some of that has to do with what I just mentioned, that these effects depend on exactly where you are and how much you're changing. Some of it, that there's a lot of uncertainty, particularly for things like CO2 fertilization. So we know that CO2 increases yield but by how much varies quite a bit. And so if you look at some more recent crop yield studies, what you find is some models will actually show on net positive effects from climate change, some will show on net negative. And the big difference has to do with CO2 fertilization there and whether or not you're accounting for like nitrogen limitations on yield growth. And so we've got a lot of uncertainty here. And in this first study, I just wanted to see, does it matter in an economic model? So these are coming from physical models and observational studies. Um, but what, what would happen if we put this into an economic model like GCAM, what would change and does it matter? And so what I did was I just took one of those figures and I just drew a line at the top and the bottom and said, well, what if we're at the top end of this? And so we've got yields going up by the most of any of the studies that we've looked at before. And what if we're at the bottom end of this and we're just taking the biggest yield declines that you can see in the literature. So again, this is just to sort of get a sense of, if you do the maximum in either direction, what would change and would it matter? And so what we got here was when you run, um, then we're gonna do this, we're gonna do two different scenarios. Yeah. Um, with and without climate mitigation. Um, and then we're gonna do it with and without these climate impacts. Um, and then we're gonna compare the two. So what happens when you change that? Um, and so this here is showing you global cropland area here. And the black line is with no impacts. The gray area is the range between that most increase and most decrease that I've shown. And so what you see here um, and is if your yields go up by a lot, you need less land to produce the same amount of food, feed, and fiber. So you can reduce your global cropland area without anyone's food um, diet changing. So you can just reduce cropland area. You're getting more per unit of land. The opposite is also true, though. If your yields are going down by a lot, then you need more land area to feed the same number of people the same amount of calories. And so what we can get here is that the, the cropland area is going to roughly track the yield change. So if, it goes, if yields go up, then we need less. If yields go down, they need more. Um, but you do actually see a difference. It's not as big as the human system effects that I was showing earlier. So I have larger cropland area changes from changing population and income than I do from changing yield here. This also plays out in terms of the economy on price. So the lower the yields are, the more uh, pressures you put on, uh, the, the higher the price has to be for people to keep using it. So if you think about this, if you own a piece of land, what you're going to do with it depends on how much money you can make. And so if your yields are going down, the only way you're going to want to keep doing that is if you're going to make more money some other way. And so what we see here is a price response that's the inverse of the yield response, or of the cropland area response. So when yields go up, prices go down, when yields go down, prices go up. And you see that, and that can actually trigger in your demand system where you might actually get dietary change. If prices change enough, people will change what they eat. Um, these changes aren't big enough to notice it here. So in our mitigation scenario, what we found is there's actually an interplay between impacts and mitigation because one of your mitigation strategies requires land, and that's bioenergy. And so what we found here is that when you had yields go up, you had more room for bioenergy, and so you had more mitigation potential from the land, and you got more bioenergy consumption. Um, and the converse is also true. So if you, if you had lower yields, then you had less room for bioenergy, and you had less bioenergy that plays out in your mitigation scenario. And this actually affected your carbon prices. Again, it's not a huge effect, but it's not nothing. And so we ended up with different um, higher carbon prices in our low yield scenarios. We didn't see as much different in the high yield scenario but you get a, a differences in cost of mitigation when you factor in crop yields. Um, and so this does play out into the system. It does change emissions. It's not as big of an effect as you might think, but particularly in the reference scenario where you have a lot of warming, you weren't using a lot of bioenergy anyway, and so changing the yield doesn't really play out there. If we did impacts on a different thing, so if we looked at 
energy demand or energy supply, you might see more energy system emissions changes. But when playing this out on the land, it's a small effect on emissions overall. And so that's what happens if you change the Earth system and account for those effects on humans. And so the last thing I want to do is put those two things together. So my first study was, what if we're evolving and that's affecting climate, but we're not going to affect, account for back? Second one is, what if the climate is evolving? Now, the third one is, what if you do the th those two things simultaneously? And this is from a, a paper that came out about a year ago with a bunch of colleagues at Oak Ridge and Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Um, and here what we've done is we've swapped the simple climate model that we used in the first two studies out, and now we're going to use an Earth system model. We're going to use the community Earth system model that's developed at NCAR, and we're going to couple that to GCAM in code. And so at every GCAM time step, we exchange information between CESM and GCAM. And the precise information that we're exchanging in this particular study that I'm going to show, we have uh, more recent studies where more information is exchanged. So we're going to pass the land use and land cover from GCAM into the, this, the community earth system model. And then we're going to take changes in productivity back. And so it's basically combining parts of what I just showed you. So this productivity back is going to affect crop yields in the same way that the study I just showed you did. Um, and then in the beginning, the land use and cover is going to affect climate, particularly through changes in albedo and carbon cycles. And so what we've done with this study um, is we're going to do this based on one forcing level right now. This is a, a big Earth system model. It takes a lot of computing time, and so we're not going to run nearly as many as we did in my first study, where um, we're just using the integrated <coughs> assessment model. And we're going to do with and without these feedbacks. So in all of these cases, we'll take the land use land cover from GCAM and pass it into CESM, but only in the included or coupled 4-5 case will we do this productivity signal back. And then we're going to compare the difference. So what happens if you include these feedbacks versus if you exclude these feedbacks? And the first thing I want to show you is just what are the feedbacks, right? So when I, if you looked at that study I showed before, some, some models show positive increases in yield due to climate, some show negative. And so which is this model doing? And this is the productivity, and this is a scalar. So one means no climate change. Um, or no effective climate on productivity, positive means yields are going up. And so this particular model, the CO2 fertilization effect, is balancing any negative impacts of climate in this scenario um, for the places where we're actually growing crops. So this is an, a, a scalar that's not an aggregate over the whole world. It's just over the places where we've actually planted um, crops. And so what we see here is we're getting about a 10% increase in yield. Um, and also in productivity of other land types. So the amount of carbon stored in forests and grassland is also going up by about 10% compared to a no climate um, scenario. And so what that change in productivity did, does is just like before, we're going to end up with a change in land use land cover. So if our yields are 10% higher, we need less cropland to grow the same amount of food. And so we get a decline in cropland, that's the red um, here, and then we make up for it by increasing some other land types. And in particular, in this scenario, is one where we're using afforestation as a mitigation strategy. So the primary thing that goes up is every little bit of cropland we free, we plant a forest on um, so that we can get some more carbon storage. Um, and it's just the way we've set up the incentives there. Um, and so you end up with more trees. You end up with some more bioenergy, because again, this is also a place where there is some mitigation incentives for bioenergy. But you're getting those two going up. Um, in, in place of all the cropland area. And what this ends up doing, though, if you've got more land in forest than in crops, and your forests are 10% more productive than before, then you're going to end up storing more carbon in the land. And so what we get here, this is the change in carbon storage due to these feedbacks. So um, it's subtracting the, the total column carbon from the coupled and the uncoupled case, and we're getting an increase in the land Sorry, wrong button. In the land carbon storage, it's on the order of about 10 petagrams of carbon, um, which isn't that much. It amounts to about 5 ppm CO2. Um, but it is an increase there. And where it's coming from is we're getting less carbon in the atmosphere and ocean. Um, and so you do actually, in this, since we're running a full Earth system model, you will see differences in CO2 concentration coming out um, due to this um, swapping of carbon. We also, since we got more bioenergy, that was one of the things, it wasn't a huge effect um, in terms of land area, it does end up reducing energy system CO2 emissions by about 17%. So we do, um, this is already a low CO2 world or a lower, and so then we end up with more bioenergy because of these feedbacks and we reduce the emissions even more. 
And just this is a paper that we've done as a follow-on. It's still in review, but we're looking at what happens locally. And so when you look at this, as I said, it was only about 5 ppm CO2, and so you don't really see a big change in, in, in global mean temperature. It's not statistically significant. You can see some changes in variability, but not in the actual mean state. Um, but when you start to look at it, lo um, local temperature changes, and here this stippling um, is indicating that it's um, significant. Um, you do see in some areas you'll see significant changes, and, and some of these have to do with exactly the land use change you're doing there. Some of them have to do with teleconnections, where you are getting these differences um, that are that can be significant and can be as much as one degree Celsius, um, depending on where you are. Uh, and so that's what we're looking into now. And so just to wrap up, and I think we are close to back on time, so we'll have time for discussion. Um, so what I've been looking at is changes in human activity, like energy and land and their implications on the Earth system. And these are, are through changes in emissions, land cover, and land management. And when I showed you this study, I showed you a very, very large number of, symbol, of scenarios because a lot of this is really uncertain. Um, so if we're thinking about what's going to happen in 2100, on the human system side, there's a lot of things we don't know. We don't know, you think back 100 years ago from now, none of us would have, had a, uh, would have thought about cell phones. Um, and you know, at that point in time, when we were looking at cars, internal combustion engines and electric vehicles were both sort of in play and internal combustion engines won. And so there's a lot of uncertainty there. And so what we end up doing when we're looking at the effects of human systems on climate is spanning as much of this range as we possibly can. So lots of scenarios, lots of population, lots of income, lots of technology assumptions, lots of policy assumptions, and trying to figure out where that plays in. The second thing that we looked into was changes in the Earth system and their implications on human systems through changes in crop yield, but there's also effects from energy demand, energy supply, and water availability. Here you're playing out two different uncertainties. So there's an uncertainty in the physical response to a change in emissions in land cover that's important. So if you look across all of the Earth system models that have contributed to previous inner comparisons, we don't even agree on the sign of precipitation changes over large spaces in the world. And so that's something you have to play out here. If you want to understand how those Earth system changes affect humans, we need to understand what those are and what the uncertainty is. But then it also does matter what's your underlying um, socioeconomic world. And so some of these worlds, it's easier to adapt than others. Some you have more or less people, and that'll interplay with how those effects do. And so then the last thing I've been working on is doing this simultaneously, um, and how those doing everything simultaneously could affect our understanding of human and Earth systems. And this is sort of motivated by, if you look back at the, the climate research community, it's largely been siloed. So there's a group that does effects of emissions on climate. There's a group that does emission, human systems on emissions, and they don't really talk. And so one of the things we've been trying to do here is does it matter? Do you need to do these at the same time? And so where we're going from here um, is we're trying to explore more interactions. Um, so some of the things that we're, we're looking at right now in, in terms of human to earth systems, all of the studies I showed you so far um, on that, we've been focused in the, in the bigger system modeling space on just CO2, but non-CO2 also matters. And some of the reasons we haven't been doing it is a lot of the Earth system models, um, atmospheric chemistry is really expensive to incorporate, and so they're not really doing prognostic methane or N2O, and so that's harder to incorporate. And so trying to figure out how we can capture those non-CO2 emissions effects on climate. Um, as well as irrigation. So I have some colleagues out in Washington State that do a lot of work on the effects of irrigation on local climate and looking at how it changes evapotranspiration and, and temperature changes. In terms of Earth systems effects on humans, um, most of the work I've done so far has focused on crop yields and land use land cover change. Um, but there's some, some emerging work within my institute and others looking at changes on energy supply, um, in particular through uh, power plant cooling and um, hydropower availability. Um, things on energy demand, I showed you one study. This, um, this is where you have this counterbalancing heating and cooling, um, and then uh, water availability in general. The other thing is just exploring my uncertainties. As, as I said, that there's a lot of things we don't know about how the future will involve, and so which, which of those are important to narrow down? Is climate sensitivity the thing we should be focusing on, or is it the number of people we have? And I don't think we have a really good sense right now of where the biggest uncertainties are. And I think a lot of that will have to depend on what you define as your variable of interest. So if you're really interested in one variable, you might have a different set of uncertainties that are important than if you're interested in another. Um, and then in, 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 in addition to just scenario uncertainty, I think parametric and structural uncertainty. And structural uncertainty is really hard here because there are only two other models that have tried to do this simultaneous 
um, human and earth system feedback. So the Chinese model has been doing it recently. And there was a French model a few years ago, but the French project has ended as far as I know. Um, and so we're kind of the only ones exploring it. And so we can do a lot of this. Um, and I think the national labs are perhaps a good place to try this out, but we are not getting structural uncertainty um, by just doing two models. So with that, I will stop and take questions. Question? Do you or can you validate this model by running over the last century? Or? Yes. So both of them, all of the models I work on now, we have done that. Um, I will say, so the Earth System modeling community has had that in their history for a very long time. It's actually a, 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 an experiment they compare across um, in order to do metrics. The integrated assessment modeling community has not done that in the past. It's not a tradition that comes out of economics. Um, we decided about three or four years ago that it's a really important thing to do when you learn a lot about your model. Um, and there's, you know, why, if you can't get history right, then what, you know, what are you going to do there? So we've been doing it. And so we have two, we have three published papers on it, and we're trying to make it part of um, our, more of our model development in the way that the Earth System model community works. So the validation of the model. It does not. So uh, on the land side, what we end up seeing is that we get trends right at global levels. Um, what we miss is interannual variability, and that's not surprising given that we are usually looking at five to ten years at a time. Um, and then the other thing we see is sometimes we get regional cancellation. We're, for reasons I don't totally understand, much better at the U.S. than we are at other regions. Um, on some level that makes sense. We live here, but I don't think we did anything different in the U.S., and so we're still trying to figure that out. But we have taken a couple of papers that we've published on that as a way of guiding our future research. And so we have been getting questions about looking at shorter time steps. And so we're learning from that high cast experiment as to what do you have to do in order to get that variability correct? Um, and what were the assumptions that were wrong in the model? And so we think it's a really useful tool. And my ideal world is that we would use these sort of historic validation tests before we put any new development in the model. But we need to make it a little more automated right now. It's very manual. So we're just doing it you know, every year-ish. Have you actually run retrospectively like your third type of thing where you're using the climate model to feed back and forth? No, that one we haven't. I think so. part of the problem with the first version we did of that two-way feedback is that we, we tried to get the model to work. So it's coupled in code, but we didn't set it up in a way that was super flexible. And so we're right now going back and making it more flexible so that we can more easily change what's the start year which variables are being passed. And so then I think that that would be something we'll start doing in, in a year or two. Yeah. OK, so with that, let's ramp up. And thanks for speaking.